we were on this slide where we looked at the uh, compared the equation of first law for the closed system and open system. And before that, we have uh, looked at the much simpler equation of conservation of mass. And if you have looked at the um, comparison, you will notice that the interaction terms remain the same or more or less the same and terms pertaining to mass inflow and mass outflow, they get involved on the right hand side. So, if we do this in an analogous manner, what shall we get for the second law? The second law quite often known as the entropy principle for a closed system uh, in terms of I have written in terms of the entropy generation term S dot P. That means, I have just taken the equation delta S equals d q by t or integral d q by t plus S P differentiated that in differential form and we get d s of the system by d t or d by d t of the entropy of the system is summation of q by t. I have written summation of q by t just for simplicity. This could be summation if there are different q dots at different t's. If uh, as q dot takes place the temperature changes, you will have to have a d q dot by t integration and in a most general case a summation of an integration. I think you will be able to take care of that plus s dot p. Actually, this is the equation on the left hand side here is the definition of s dot p. The second law actually dictates that s dot p is greater than or equal to 0. Now, I think I forgot to mention yesterday for some reason it is my habit to write greater than or equal to or less than or equal to by two symbols stacked over each other and not the mathematical symbol where greater than or equal to is a greater than sign with the lower arm doubled up and less than or equal to is a less than sign with the lower arm doubled up. That is ok, but I prefer this nomenclature for the simple reason that it tells us that it can be greater than 0 or it can be equal to 0 and the equal to 0 has a special uh, connotation and that means it is the reversible limit okay. and that is why I would like at least I would like to continue using this nomenclature, but I do not insist that others use this nomenclature although I would prefer this nomenclature to be used. While uh, doing uh, word processing in LaTeX, I have to create such a symbol because if you write greater than or equal to, it will use the standard uh, mathematical greater than or equal to. Okay. Coming back to our second law, now if you convert this from closed system to open system, what is going to happen? I think you would have guessed that the system here will be replaced by control volume. These two terms will not change, but you will have a term which would be m dot i s i minus m dot e s e added on to the right hand side. So, notice that as in the earlier two equations conservation of mass and conservation of energy, we have two appropriate terms added on the right hand side. On the left hand side, the subscript system has been replaced by control volume. Otherwise, nothing else had changed. I recommend that you spend time on this so that you appreciate the similarity and the small specific differences which exist between the two. This is necessary because later on when we consider more complex systems where along with a fluid various components flow in okay, uh, different chemical species as for example, in case of uh, psychrometry along with air moisture flows in and moisture flows out we can write a an equation for conservation of moisture or tomorrow you have some other property suppose hydrogen and oxygen go in you can write an equation for conservation of hydrogen and you can write an equation for conservation of oxygen and there everywhere on the left hand side you will have a rate of change term on the right hand side you will have the inflow and outflow terms 
and on the right hand side you will have some other terms which in general are known as the source and sink terms. So, that is why I uh, prefer to show this to you by analogy. If you do not believe analogy is proper, convince yourself that this is the true derivation by going back to our control volume and deriving this expression from first principles. Now, so far we have considered our open system to behave in a more or less general way. We will say let the state of the system change with time. So, on the left hand side for the uh, mass conservation equation we have d m c v by d t, we have d e c v by d t on the left hand side of the energy equation and we have d s c v by d t for the uh, second law that is the entropy equation. So, quite often we find that our equipment works in so called steady state. A steady state is one in which things do not generally vary with time. That means, the interactions q dot w dot s, m dot i and m dot e are constant. Constant means invariant with time and not only that, the state of the system does not change with time. So, the mass of control volume does not change with time, energy of the control volume does not change with time and even the entropy of the control volume does not change with time. Thus, a, thus such a situation is known as a steady state. It is a common fault or common not uncommon trap to assume that a steady state only means these three. Okay. Steady state does not mean just these three derivatives to be 0. It also means that q dot w dot s m dot i and m dot t are constant and invariable in time at least over a given period of time may not be indefinitely. Now, in a steady state what happens? Let us substitute what we have decided to define the steady state that these are invariable with time, but we do not have the derivatives of this. So, the expressions do not change, but these are put to 0. So, we put our left hand side to 0 and for convenience we will transpose some terms from the right hand side to the left hand side or flip the equation. So, the conservation of mass becomes m dot i equals m dot e and if you have one inlet and one exit both are equal and we use a common symbol m dot for them and we call this not as mass inflow and mass outflow, but the mass flow rate through the system, the flow of mass through the system enters as well as leaves. The first law becomes q dot minus w dot s, this term is brought to the left hand side. On the right hand side we have m dot into he plus v e squared by 2 plus g z e that is the exit velocity exit term. The inflow term is m dot into h i plus v i squared by 2 plus g z i and since now m dot e equals m dot i and is replaced by m dot it is common to combine terms like this. We write it as m dot into h e minus h i plus v squared by 2 plus v i squared by 2 plus v squared by 2 minus v i squared by 2 plus g z e minus z i. Okay. And again it is common to write this h e minus h i as delta h the increase in enthalpy from inlet to exit, delta E k this is the change in enthalpy from inlet to exit. So, delta E k is the change in kinetic energy from inlet to exit and delta E p is the change in gravitational potential energy from inlet to exit. The second law becomes m dot into S e minus S i is sigma of that q by t term plus s dot p with the second law dictating that s dot p is greater than or equal to 0. And here you should notice that there are three terms and you can play with these three terms the way we have played with uh, delta s dq by t or ds dq by t and dsp. 
So, if q dot by t is 0, we will say that our control volume is adiabatic. If s dot p is 0, we will say that the processes of flow and uh, thermodynamics involved with the control volume are reversible. And m dot into a c minus s i means the inlet, if this is 0, the inlet and exit states are isentropic. We do not know about the process inside, we have not looked at it, but we will say that the inlet and exit states are isentropic. And that means that you can have the inlet and exit isentropic, but you can have this positive, this negative. So, you need not have an adiabatic system, you need not have reversible uh, situation. Similarly, you can have inlet and exit states isentropic, but you can have adiabatic control volume, but that need not lead to isentropic inlet and exit states, because you could have a c greater than s i and s dot p greater than 0. That also means that if you have an adiabatic open system with one inlet and one exit, the exit entropy has to be higher than or at most equal to the inlet entropy. And in the similar fashion, a, an open system in which all reversible processes are taking place need not be a situation where inlet and exit states are isentropic. You could have a c greater than or less than a psi depending on the appropriate values of q dot as dictated by q dot by t. So, this is a small exercise of thinking and discussion which I will leave to yourself. And since most of our situations in practice or a large number are steady state situations, uh, we will use these equations very often. Now, as teachers, we make a mistake that we consider that the steady state situations are very, very common and tend to neglect unsteady state situations. That is not true. Unsteady state situations are also common. In fact, most of the processing is unsteady, the steady state situation is only an approximation which is true in a few cases. Now, we will use simplified forms for special cases. Why do we need those simplified forms? Because not all terms in the equations which we have derived are often significant and we also need to make suitable assumptions quite often. Of course, whenever we make these assumptions, uh, we better be realistic and we check whether these assumptions are valid. And we will now look at some typical classes of devices and look at the default assumptions and the simplified forms that these lead us to. Simplified forms of the first law of thermodynamics and the second law of thermodynamics for open systems. First, we look at heat transfer devices, the so called heat transfer devices such as boilers, condensers, heaters, coolers, heat exchangers. The purpose of this is to absorb or reject heat and one consequence is the any fluid stream which goes through such heat transfer device will have a significant delta H either positive or negative. In case of say boilers, heaters, delta H is likely to be significantly positive. For coolers and condensers, delta H is generally significantly negative. For heat exchangers, there are usually two streams, sometimes more. And when there are two streams, one stream will have a significantly positive delta H, another stream will have a significantly negative delta H. A typical thing is for such things, there is no W dot S or hardly any W dot S. A boiler may have a small pump or circulator somewhere inside, but the interaction is negligible compared to other terms. So, although I may say no W dot S, well you may have a boiler with a W dot S, either take care of it or assume and demonstrate that the value of W dot S is negligible compared to other terms. So, our symbolism reduces a heat transfer devices device in steady state to something like this. M dot is the mass flow through it, inlet and exit are the states I and E 
q dot is absorbed and w dot s is 0. Not only that, we find that q dot and delta h are significant and quite often usually delta e k and delta e p are pretty small negligible. So, if no information is provided or no uh, assumptions or no information is provided or we cannot compute these, it is quite often convenient to assume these to be 0, delta E k and delta E p. You should also note that for many of these devices, delta p from inlet to exit is also pretty small. The first law in this case reduces to this simple equation q dot is m dot into h e minus h i. There is no special simplification for the second law. We now come to work transfer devices. These are of more interest because of uh, the work transfer interaction and the second law coming into play very significantly. Work transfer devices are turbines, compressors, pumps, fans, blowers, etc. Very common devices. The purpose in these devices is to have significant power transfer. All these are consumers or producers of significant power and significant delta H. Turbines as we know are producers of power, turbines including wind turbines and hydro turbines. Compressors, pumps, fans, blowers are consumers of power and for all of these the delta H of the stream is significant. For turbines, the delta H of the fluid flowing is uh, significantly negative number. For compressors, pumps, fans and bow blowers, it is a positive number. These things are not heat transfer devices. In fact, heat transfer quite often creates problems or reduces efficiency of these devices and hence if they work at very high or very low temperatures, they are well insulated. Okay. So, the heat transfer rate between the system and the surroundings is negligible and the adiabatic of, uh, assumption is often valid and is one of the default assumptions made. For these devices, we have some standard symbols which are often used. For a turbine, we have a um, channel with increasing area from left to right. For a compressor, we have a channel with an decreasing area from left to right. And for a pump, we often have a circle with an arrow showing the rate of uh, the direction of increase of pressure from inlet to exit. Of course, for pumps, there are other symbols used. For example, sometimes the exit will be shown as a tangent to the circle with inlet going right up to the center of the circle. That symbol is quite often used for a, a centrifugal pump. Similarly, a symbol with a rectangle with a piston at the bottom showing inlet and exit both at the top is sometimes used for a reciprocating pump. But those are you know technical details used in appropriate industry and there may be some industry standards for these. But for our course in thermodynamics, something like a rectangle for a heat transfer device and these three symbols for work transfer devices are good enough. Now, such devices as I have said are usually adiabatic, W dot S and delta H are the most significant terms. Again, quite often the changes in kinetic energy and potential energy are small can be assumed negligible. One should remember that for these devices, most of these devices except perhaps for fans, the delta P is significant from inlet to exit, significant rise in pressure or significant drop in pressure. So, the first law is reduced to with these assumptions W dot S is M dot into H i minus H e. Similar to the work transfer law, but here on the right hand side H i and H e come in different order. That is because we have two different signs for 
q and w on the right hand side of the first law. The second law becomes m dot into a c minus s i which represents the rate at which entropy is produced s dot p this should be greater than or equal to 0 and that automatically means that under default assumptions these pieces of equipment will have their entropy exit entropy higher than or in the limiting case equal to the inlet entropy. And hence it is very important for us to take care of this whenever we consider uh, work transfer devices as open systems. And it will be very useful for us to look at the enthalpy entropy diagrams for such systems. Now that brings us to the importance of enthalpy entropy diagrams. Why are they important? Because notice, go back to the previous slide, enthalpy difference dictates the work transfer or power output. The entropy difference tells us how reversible or how near to the reversible limit it is. And it is for this difference, uh, with these reasons that uh, the significance of the entropy and enthalpy, enthalpy entropy or the Molière diagram was realized decades ago, maybe a century ago. In fact, that diagram was uh, developed even before a complete and full understanding of the principles of thermodynamics. So, that is another illustration which tells us that industry goes ahead whether science uh, explains all the phenomena properly or not. So, let us look at the HS diagram of adiabatic work transfer devices. Since we have devices in which enthalpy can rise significantly or enthalpy can drop significantly, we have to look at these two diagrams in two different ways. On the left hand side here, I have a enthalpy entropy diagram for a typical compressor and on the right hand side, I have an enthalpy entropy diagram for a typical turbine. And in all these cases, it is assumed that we have a steady state, delta E k, delta E p are negligible and the equipment is adiabatic. Now, here you will notice that the inlet state I and the exit state E are such that S E is greater than S I. The limiting case will be E star where the exit pressure will be maintained, but the exit entropy would be equal to the inlet entropy. It is traditional to show the ideal line by means of a continuous line, this is the isentropic line. But the actual process being irreversible, it is shown by a dotted line. Actually, there is no reason for us to even show this continuously, because we do not know what the intermediate states are. But we could simply join I and E by means of another dotted line. But tradition says, join this by a continuous line, join this by a dotted line. Similarly, for a turbine, this is the inlet, the actual exit will be generally at a entropy higher than the inlet entropy, but there is an ideal exit state indicated by E star, which will be at the same entropy as inlet. And again by tradition and convention, we for E and E star, the exit pressure maintained both for the compressor as well as the turbine. And now one thing you should remember that whether it is compressor or whether it is turbine, the state E lies at higher entropy compared to state E star or state I, whether it is a compressor or a turbine. Entropy of E is higher than entropy of E star which equals the entropy of I and the enthalpy of E is always higher than the enthalpy of E star, whether it is a compressor or a turbine. Enthalpy of E is higher than enthalpy of E star. Now, 
based on these diagrams for adiabatic turbines and adiabatic compressors, we have some definitions which are very common in study of thermodynamics and its applications. First, let us look at an adiabatic turbine and its HS diagram. A turbine is one in which the enthalpy of the fluid is reduced significantly from HI to HE. There is not no significance in delta E k and delta E p and this reduction in enthalpy is used for producing power which is delivered to the outside world. The exit pressure is below the inlet pressure significantly. Now notice this entropy of A star is entropy at I, but entropy at S e is higher than entropy at S e star. Also enthalpy at H e is greater than the enthalpy at H e star. Now subtract this inequality from H i, since we are subtracting the inequality will change direction H i minus H e h i minus h e this one the real enthalpy drop will be less than or equal to the ideal enthalpy drop h i minus h e star and w dot s which is m dot into h i minus h e would be less than w dot s star which is the power output under the conditions of isentropic inlet and exit states both will be positive numbers and we define the isentropic efficiency of the turbine to be the actual power output of the turbine divided by the ideal power output of the turbine. The ideal power output of the turbine is defined as the one in which the entropy of the exit state would equal the entropy of the inlet state at unchanged exit pressure. And one should remember that this isentropic efficiency of the turbine is defined and is definable only for an adiabatic turbine. If it is not adiabatic, then this relation is not valid, this relation is not valid and hence the further derivations are on weak foundation. In a similar fashion, let us look at an adiabatic compressor and its HS diagram. All that has happened is PI and PE have shifted their locations. Now PI is lower than PE, PE is higher than PI. Otherwise the other relations are still applicable. SE star is still equal to SI and SE is still higher than SE star and hence HE is still higher than HE star. Now what we do is subtract from this inequality H e greater than or equal to H e star H i. So the actual enthalpy rise is higher than the ideal enthalpy rise. Now remember that W dot S is M dot into H i minus H e. So we will get W dot S to be less than or equal to W dot S star, but both are negative and since both are negative in magnitude W dot S star will be lower than W dot S. It is like W dot S being something like minus 15 kilowatt whereas W dot S star being minus uh, 10 kilowatt. So both are negative but minus 15 is algebraically less than minus 10. So in magnitude W dot S star will be lower than W dot S and hence we define the isentropic efficiency of the compressor in a slightly different way compared to the definition of the isentropic efficiency of a turbine. For a turbine it is W dot S divided by W dot S star. Both in turbine, in case of turbine both W dot S and W dot S star are positive numbers. In case of turbine, in case of a compressor, 
both W dot S and W dot S star are negative numbers and the isentropic efficiency of the compressor is defined as W dot S star divided by W dot S and this difference should be noted. And it is defined like this for no particular reason except that psychologically we are uh, tuned to the fact or tuned to the belief that efficiency should be a number always less than or equal to 1. But that does not mean that we force all efficiencies to be less than 1. All of us are mechanical engineers and we know that welding is a uh, very popular and very useful metal joining process and the efficiency of weld is defined in such a way that quite often the efficiency of a weldment turns out to be greater than 1. And when it turns out to be greater than 1, the user of that equipment is happy because there is no deterioration in its performance. There are no additional limits on its performance. Let us go further. There are some other adiabatic devices and one of the most important adiabatic device that we will come across is the nozzle. The nozzle is not a work transfer device. The nozzle is not a heat transfer device. Nozzles and diffusers are unique in their own way. For a nozzle which is a very common component in steam turbines, the purpose is to reduce enthalpy but increase velocity. The typical symbol for the nozzle is a converging long duct, sometimes shown as converging diverging with just inlet and exit and the exit velocity shown because that is the important outlet parameter that we need. Typically for a nozzle, the exit pressure is significantly below the inlet pressure. The exit enthalpy is significantly below the inlet enthalpy. So, these two characteristics the nozzle shares with a typical turbine. Exit pressure lower than inlet pressure, exit enthalpy lower than inlet enthalpy. But the difference is we are producing no power, our job is to see to it that our exit velocity is large and is definitely significantly higher than the inlet velocity. There is no attempt to extract power, so W dot S is 0 and we try to maintain no heat transfer. So, a nozzle, a proper nozzle is a good adiabatic device and because it is adiabatic and because pressure reduces the HS diagram, the enthalpy entropy or Molière diagram for uh, a nozzle is similar to that of the turbine. So, let us look at the HS diagram of a typical adiabatic nozzle. Notice that if we apply first law in steady state, all terms will vanish and if we neglect the delta E p, only delta H and delta E k terms will remain and first law will reduce to H e plus V e squared by 2 is H i plus V i squared by 2. Because it is adiabatic, the ideal situation would be an exit state of E star at a lower enthalpy and lower entropy than the actual exit state E. Suppose I were to have an ideal nozzle which is adiabatic and with reversible and reversible and inlet entropy equal to exit entropy, then the first law will reduce to H e star plus V e star squared by 2 is H i plus V i squared by 2. <coughs> now, since H e star is less than H e, V e star for the ideal nozzle would be higher than the V e which is the exit velocity of the actual nozzle. And hence, we define the isentropic efficiency of nozzle as the actual specific kinetic energy at the exit of the nozzle divided by the ideal, uh, the kinetic energy at the exit under the ideal situation, isentropic situation and which generally will be less than 1. In the limit, it will be equal to 1. Notice that the isentropic efficiency of the nozzle is defined not in terms of velocities, 
but in terms of kinetic energy because when it comes to efficiencies of turbines and nozzles, turbines, compressors and nozzles, the efficiency uh, is expected to be a ratio of entities like work or energy or power. That is why we do not use the ratio of velocity. However, in actual turbine theory, the ratio of velocity is also used as a parameter and that is quite often known as the velocity coefficient of the nozzle. In thermodynamics, we do not have to talk about velocity coefficient. Finally, let us look at a very special case that of an adiabatic duct. Let us say that I have a control volume shown by dotted line just for the sake of it and a long pipe or duct flows through it and this is adiabatic. So, as the fluid flows from the inlet I to the exit E, there is no heat transfer. And since it is a simple duct, I have made no attempt to make uh, to extract or provide any uh, power, W dot S is also 0. There may be some flow work which will be there if something is flowing, we do not worry about it. In this case, the first law will reduce to in short symbols delta H plus delta E K plus delta E P is 0 or separating inlet uh, keeping inlet terms on one side and exit terms on other the side we will get H i plus V i squared by 2 plus G Z i equals H e plus V squared by 2 plus G Z e. And if the state at inlet and exit such that the inlet specific energy, specific internal energy equals the exit specific internal energy. Then this reduces to P i V i which I write as P i divided by rho i plus V i squared by 2 plus G Z i is P i P e by rho e plus V e squared by 2 plus G Z e which all of us will realize is the Bernoulli equation. Now a question here. Traditionally, the Bernoulli derived in fluid dynamics. In fact, thermodynamics does not claim to own the Bernoulli equation. It is the science of fluid dynamics which claims to own the Bernoulli equation. And in fluid dynamic, the standard way of deriving the Bernoulli equation is to consider a stream tube or a stream line in, in the limit. Apply the conservation of momentum to a slice in the stream tube is known as the Euler equation and then integrate the Euler equation along conservation of momentum, not looked at the conservation of momentum. We have looked at only conservation of energy and this is now a representation of conservation of energy. If you have studied fluid dynamics, ask your this question or if you consider not an expert in fluid dynamics, then get hold of a colleague or a friend who is an expert in fluid dynamics, explain this situation to him and you yourself or you two together should discuss this matter that whether Bernoulli equation really represents conservation of energy or does it represent conservation of momentum or does it represent two different things and only the end result seems to be similar. If so, why? We will not discuss this particular aspect any further because that would mean encroaching on the domain of fluid dynamics by us, which we will not do. That encroachment is allowed only during a study of compressible fluid flow, which uh, you will do with Professor uh, Balchandra Puranik on Monday and Tuesday. So, at the end of this, I have latched on to 1257 HCTM Technical Campus Kaithal Haryana. Over to you. Yesterday, we were talking about the entropy as the entropy is always increasing. So, what will be the limit of the increase in entropy in the universe? Uh, this is a typical question. Entropy increases, but entropy increases only in an adiabatic system. And the other issue which we generally come across is the confusion over the term universe. Universe in thermodynamics means 
any suitable adiabatic system. The universe in thermodynamics has nothing to do with our actual physical universe and because of that uh, although thermodynamics tells us that the entropy of an adiabatic system always increases at least today in these days we do not really have to worry about the rise in entropy of the universe because the physical universe is not really modelable today as a thermodynamic universe. We are not sure whether it is a diabetic system at all. Over to you. In the thermodynamic relations, there is a availability, reversibility, will you touch it or not in thermodynamics? Uh, yes, we will be discussing terms like availability and exergy beginning Wednesday in topic 12, which is called combined first and second laws. I have devoted one full day typically or three fourths of a day to that discussion. 1163 Avinashi Lingam Koimtur, over to you. What is the difference between a classical thermodynamics and statistical thermodynamics? Can you throw some light on it, sir? See, by classical thermodynamics, we mean the following. If you see the history of thermodynamics, thermodynamics was developed in two or three different streams. One was the thermodynamics which was developed by engineers. For the thermodynamics, the develop was technology development by engineers for water wheels, steam turbines, wind turbines, boilers and all that without even understanding what they are doing. That was one development of thermodynamics where people handled fluids like air, water, various gases. Then physicists and chemists started working on materials in their lab and they developed thermodynamics in their own ways. They realized that uh, you know Dalton's law of partial pressures and various laws of physical chemistry made us realize that material is made up of uh, atoms and molecules and everything is a collection of these. When thermodynamics was formalized, it was realized that there are some very general principles of thermodynamics for which we need consider our material to be only a continuum and based on observations on the behavior of continuum, we will be able to derive our laws of thermodynamics. That today is known as classical thermodynamics, okay. whereas the modern thermodynamics considers the fact that each and everything is made up of atoms and molecules and these atoms and molecules will behave like either point particles or extended particles or minute rigid bodies. They will interact by collision, electromagnetic uh, forces. But then to keep track of these, we need to handle a very large number of pieces of information. For example, you know that even if you take just one mole of a fluid, it will have the Avogadro number of molecules n a. So, each molecule even if you consider it to be a particle will have three positions point particle. So, that means 3 into Avogadro number of positions uh, all changing with respect to time. So, you will have to write ordinary differential equations a set of ordinary differential equations the order of that set will be 3 into Avogadro number. Now imagine solving these in time, when we know that on an average their average momentum is going to be the same, average energy is going to be the same. So we do averaging and we end up with uh, kinetic theory and statistical thermodynamics. When we are in engineering, particularly in mechanical engineering, we find that a vast majority of our applications do not need us to look at all these details. Hence we work with classical thermodynamics. And naturally, if we work with static uh, classical thermodynamics, our aim is to remain in the classical domain to the extent possible. So, even for situations where we have reactions or we have mixtures, we will try to extend our classical domain to the extent possible. And today, we have a situation and our understanding is so neat that even reacting things, boilers, turbines, uh, turbines do not react, but we have mixer, mixtures there. All these things can be handled by minor modifications to the classical theory of thermodynamics. I hope this explains it. Over to you. 
sir uh, i have a doubt regarding the refrigeration uh, system mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the refrigeration system how about uh, increasing the number of blowers in the freezer what would be the impact if you know increase the number of blowers in the freezer will it affect the efficiency of the freezer sir this uh, it's a question which uh, is on the borderline of thermodynamics and heat transfer we know that the evaporator which is at the heart of the freezer absorbs heat from the whatever is the material surrounding it okay we want good heat transfer between the uh, freezing chest or the frozen material and the evaporator so that the material is kept cool it doesn't get heated up because of heat gain from outside so we want good heat transfer and for this we provide a blower or a fan now the fan provides increases the heat transfer coefficient so reduces the temperature drop or temperature difference between the cold space and the evaporator now this increases the evaporator temperature and hence it increases the coefficient of performance of the refrigeration cycle but the blower requires a power to be consumed so now the question that arises is that if i do not have a blower i don't consume blower power but my evaporator temperature goes down and hence my cop decreases and hence the refrigerator power goes up if i use a blower refrigerator power goes down but the blower power goes up the answer to this is not unique it depends on the situation at hand and you will have to do the calculations in detail of the two situations considering the characteristic of your refrigeration system as well as the characteristic of the blower and then decide whether to have a blower or not and if you have a blower what should be its capacity power consumption flow rate and all that over to you thank you very much sir over to you sir thank you